a warning that this coronavirus outbreak could be followed by another. This may become an annual event like seasonal flu. Concerns Chinese authorities are covering up the country's role in the crisis. Officials have suggested in recent days that the virus didn't come from China. And advice on how to self-isolate with children. This is Coronavirus, the latest from The Telegraph. I'm Theodora Leloudis. First, it was the new James Bond film. And now it's the local government and mayoral elections. They're the latest event to be delayed by a year amid fears they would coincide with the peak of the coronavirus outbreak. But while countries in similar situations to the UK are cancelling all mass gatherings and closing schools, the UK isn't. France, Germany and now Scotland have stopped gatherings of more than 500 people. Some are accusing the government of complacency. Others suspect it's putting the economy before the nation's health. But today, the UK's chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Vallance, defended the government's approach, saying other countries had jumped on measures which sound effective, but aren't actually the most impactful. He also warned that this might not be the only outbreak of COVID-19. When you look at infections across whole communities, when you get up to about 60% of people who've had it, you get something called herd immunity, which means we're then all a bit protected from it. So that's If it does get to that level, that provides quite a lot of protection going forward as this may become an annual event like seasonal flu. It follows Boris Johnson saying the UK is looking to squash the sombrero of the outbreak. That's to say to flatten the curve with fewer new cases, but spread out over a longer period of time. But why would you want to draw out an epidemic? I put that question to The Telegraph's busiest journalist, our global health editor, Paul Nuki. The government doesn't want to see the crisis move on into next winter when the NHS will again be overburdened with other diseases and conditions. So that's one reason for getting it over with in the summer. Uh, the other, I think, is that the behavioural scientists who are advising the government are not convinced that we can facilitate a real cultural change in people's behaviour here uh, in the same way that countries like uh, Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong have seen. I'm uh, to be convinced either way, I think. If we can create a long-term cultural change and we can spread the epidemic out over a much longer period, then I think a lot of lives would be saved. And I think the real question is, is, is can we create that cultural change in the UK? Are people willing to change their habits and their lifestyles for a sustained period instead of just a very short period? Many of us were hoping to take our minds off COVID-19 this weekend, perhaps getting some light relief in the form of live televised sport. But there's bad news on that front with the announcement from the Premier League and EFL that all professional football in the UK will be suspended until at least the 3rd of April. Tom Gibbs is the host of The Telegraph's Audio Football Club podcast. I don't claim to be an expert on sport, so I asked him to break down the reasoning behind the decision. This decision brings our thinking on football in line with most of the major competitions around the world. But arguably, it's in defiance of the government's line that cancelling big events like football matches would do little to stop the spread of the virus. The decision has been taken less as a public health matter, but because practically it was getting difficult to see how teams could fulfil their fixtures. On Thursday night it was announced that the Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta had tested positive for coronavirus, and with so many other cases across British clubs, and with players and staff in self-isolation, this suspension of football seems like the only logical move. Practically, it's going to cause huge problems across football, especially with scheduling. It's now unclear when Liverpool will confirm their first league title for 30 years, but the problem goes right down the football pyramid. Will Leeds, for example, clinch their enormously lucrative expected promotion to the Premier League? And what about clubs without access to that massive TV money? They're far more reliant on revenue from ticket sales, and some of them could really struggle for as long as this ban on football continues. It's a similar story across the whole of sport, I'm afraid. The England men's cricket team tour of Sri Lanka has been postponed. Formula One racing won't take place until May at the earliest. And the golf, the Players' Championship has gone, as has the Masters in April as well. One major sporting fixture looked like going ahead this weekend. The Six Nations game between Wales and Scotland on Saturday lunchtime. It's just been postponed as well. Don't worry, there's plenty of hours of excellent old sport footage on YouTube. Madrid is the latest city to go into lockdown. Bars, restaurants and most shops have been ordered to shut by the local authority. 
Only supermarkets and pharmacies are allowed to stay open. The Foreign Office is advising Britons against all but essential travel to the capital, as well as parts of northern Spain. In the US, six states told schools to close on Monday for at least two weeks. Belgium has also announced sweeping measures, including the closure of schools, cafes and restaurants. It's where the outbreak started. China's Wuhan city, Ground Zero, reported five new cases on Friday. The second day in a row, the tally's been less than 10. All 16 temporary hospitals in Wuhan have been closed down and videos are circulating on social media of doctors removing their masks. It comes as no locally transmitted infections were reported in the rest of the country. But for some time, the Telegraph's China correspondent has raised concerns of government propaganda. Sophia Yan tells us government statements don't match up with what she's seeing in Beijing. She sent me this report from the capital. China is sending its strongest signal yet, indicating it feels the worst of the coronavirus outbreak is over. Xi Jinping, the leader of the ruling Chinese Communist Party, touched down on Tuesday in Wuhan, the outbreak epicenter. Images of his visit beamed around the world, the ultimate propaganda that the country was triumphant in, quote, the people's war against the virus. New infections do appear to be subsiding, though the numbers only began to fall a few weeks ago after China changed how we would count confirmed cases. Disease experts are worried the tally may not accurately reflect the situation. This is all part of China's efforts to reframe the narrative, to gloss over its bungled initial response. Officials have suggested in recent days that the virus didn't come from China, even saying the U.S. military might have brought coronavirus to the country. Of course, none of this matches on-the-ground reality, where discontent against the government continues to brew. And while the pace of life is slowly picking back up, things are nowhere near normal. Buying groceries, visiting a bank, going to work means registering personal details and submitting to temperature checks. Villages and housing compounds still barring outside visitors, and face masks remain a must. Beijing also hasn't rescheduled its postponed annual parliamentary meetings. So until mobility restrictions are lifted and the government is holding big political meetings, it's hard to see how China could declare victory over the virus. Self-isolation, an opportunity to catch up on all those podcasts stacking up in your feed or a period of stress, inconvenience and worry. For most people, it's probably a mixture of the two. The official advice in the UK is for anyone with a new continuous cough or high temperature to self-isolate for seven days. That means staying at home and not receiving visitors. But what if you live with other people? And what if you have children? That's a question that was sent to us by a Telegraph reader called Alex. At the end of each show, I'm going to put one of your queries to our journalists covering the outbreak. And if we can't answer it, we'll find someone who can. To answer your question, Alex, I asked my colleague Ben Gartside to look into how people who don't have the option of living alone should self-isolate. It's very important to kind of try and keep yourself as separated as possible. So one piece of government guidance that has been given is a bathroom rotor. So essentially you organise it so whoever is infected within the household uses the bathroom last in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, So people who don't yet have the virus use it first and then the person who does use it last and then it's given a thorough clean afterwards, so bleaching down all the surfaces. In terms of kind of food and food preparation, suggested that people do make food for you and leave it outside the door, so one upside from self-isolation is less meal prep, but at the same time, if you are cooking for yourself or if you have no one to do that for you, so for example, if you have a house with young children, just try and keep it as separated as possible. Do distinct washing down and try not to share the same room as someone who is infected at the same time. Telegraph reporter Ben Gartside. If you'd like us to answer any questions, maybe you've booked a holiday and want to know if you're entitled to a refund, perhaps you've run out of loo roll and want our recommendations on where to find more, whatever it is, record a voice note on your phone and email it to me at coronaviruspodcast at telegraph.co.uk and you might even hear your voice on the show or just type it in an email. This is Coronavirus, the latest from The Telegraph. I'm Theodora Leloudis, and I'll be back on Monday with another update. In the meantime, head to telegraph.co.uk slash audio, where you can get a free 30-day subscription to The Telegraph online.